Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Would you pray with me? Father, our holy creator, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the love you've provided for each one of us. We thank you for the bread of life that is Jesus Christ. And help us to share that bread with one another. Help us as we go through worship this morning to understand your love and your awesomeness, Lord. We ask for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Saints. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody back after our short hiatus that I apologize for, but we did have to follow the CDC guidelines of uh, closing down for two weeks. Um, but that is in our past, and we can go back to where we would like to be, which is coming to church every Sunday. Amen? Amen. 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 I wanted to greet you all this morning by saying, may the grace and peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So would you please rise as we sing our first hymn in the morning. Don't worry, you guys will get into it. I'll do it every Sunday morning. I will greet you with peace in Christ. Would you please rise as we sing our hymn of praise, number 174, up on the screens. Celebrations. Yes, 
this man. I can see you. Can you see me? <laughs> Put away from you 
all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want you all not to worry as you notice the shuffle in the order of worship. I promise you we're still going to worship the same God and love each other just exactly the same. But there's a reason we put communion further up in the order this morning, and that is because we wanted to give you guys an experience of God early on in the service that you can reflect on as we walk through it together. Now again, we'll be doing our communion from page um, 15. It is the service in the Word in table 3, if you would like to follow along with me. But first we're going to start with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, you know who each one of us are. You know our trust levels, you know our greed levels, you know what is in us, what we are capable of, and the love we are able to share. You know us so intimately, as a matter of fact, that you can know better than us what we want and need and truly live for. So we ask today that you forgive us of our sins, clear our souls, wipe the slate clean, as you did on the day of the cross. In Christ's holy name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Now there's a reason I pray before communion, and that reason is every Christian should ask for forgiveness before taking communion, but also they should get reassurance and know that you are forgiven. So let me make a declarative statement. You are loved by your Creator and forgiven. Amen. So let us start at the Great Thanksgiving, down at the bottom of page 15. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And so with your people on earth, in all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is God. God. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. All honor and glory is yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And on the night in which he gave himself up, he took the bread and he broke it and explained to his disciples, he said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. As you eat this and share among yourselves, know, sorry, know, <laughs> know, see, I really want you to know, <laughs> know that this is my body, which is broken for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And after the supper was concluded, he took the cup of Elijah, which nobody was supposed to drink of. He grabbed the cup, blessed the cup, and said, this is my blood that will be given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. 
Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. So we ask for a blessing to come down on this meal this morning. As we share the bread of life with one another, let us also share together the love of Christ. Amen? Amen. Can I have the communion stewards please come forward? Now, as you may know or may not know, we as Methodists believe in an open communion table. And what that really means is if you just love one another and wish to live in peace with one another and love the Lord God with all your heart, body, and soul, then you are welcome to come and share at this table. So would you now please come?
now it's time for the children. Not go at all like I had hoped, but 
Hopefully you have a better idea of what a battle is and why you should always be kind to people. Because they might always have something going on and you might not be able to see it. You might not even necessarily understand it. But there's always something going on with people. So you should always be kind. Sometimes you have a battle with your brain and your eyes. Sometimes your eyes are tricks. Right. Who would like to read this one? Me. Although that Jesus is 
a motivational speaker. He motivated you with love and words and kindness and sharing and love. And we need to know what kind of life it is that Christ would like us to lead. And in our gospel lesson for this morning, Jesus begins with this statement that says, I am. Have any of you ever heard the theory that Christ never declared he was God? Have you heard anybody ever say that? That Christ never said he was God? Well, I have. And here is a definitive statement. In their culture, this is how he is declaring he is God, because that's what God did. He said, I am. And Christ is saying this very same thing this morning. But this was also the indication that God gave Moses at the burning bush when he said, I am who I am. It was this same message that Jesus used in, the defense, in his defense against the religionist of his time when he said, before Abraham was born, I am. It is the same message we hear Paul proclaim in Colossians when he said, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. And it is the same message that John says in the book of Revelations, Jesus is who is, who was, and who is to come. Yes, we Christians only have one God, and that one God has come into this world. God came down in the form of a human being to give those who believe real life. You know, I know there are different ways that each of us all live. But we do have a choice to make. We can merely exist, or we can live a real full life. But that's only possible through Jesus Christ. I want you to think about your life for a second. Look around this church a little bit. There are many of us that are just going through the motions of this life. And this going through the motions only makes us miserable. My best friend, or one of my best friends, had lived his life this way. He was just going through the motions. He went through the motions of high school just so he could get by and get out. And now he's going through the motions of life. He gets up every morning, goes to work, comes home tired, gets up the next day to do the same thing over and over again. There is no fulfillment in his life outside of his family. There's no real joy that he takes out of life. And just a few years ago, this very same friend came to me and said, you know, if I had known that high school was going to be the best years of my life, I think I would have took the time to enjoy it more. Well, I remember him in high school, and I know him now. He was miserable then, and he is miserable today. Because he's only going through the motion of life. And for what? Why do we do it? Just to get out and get by as soon as possible? Maybe just to have a better cell phone or a bigger house or the newest car or truck? This, my friends, is not life. This is death. A slow death. In reality, what this is, is hell. Hell on earth. Living like this can lead to a hell in eternity. And here's the craziest part of it all. There are people who live this way by choice. They choose to live this way. As a matter of fact, most people choose to live this way, even most of us Christians. Now, of course, Christ offers us an alternative here. And what a great option it is. You know, in verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Are you hungry? Are you thirsting for more out of life? You know, this is one of the greatest passages, in my opinion, in John's entire gospel. It is the symbol that Jesus uses to describe himself. Jesus is saying to us that as bread gives you physical life, Jesus can give us real life. Bread feeds our bodies, and it is essential for living. But Jesus is saying, whoever, Jesus sustains our sacred souls. And how he does that is with a radically new relationship that we begin between us and God, thanks to Jesus. And without Jesus in the picture, this real life, which is more, much more than just existence, is not possible. Many who are just going through the motions of this life are very aware that they are doing that. They know that they are just merely existing. I can tell you before I became a pastor, I know I did. I knew it. I was very aware of it. And still pushed off God's call in my life. But you know, when we decide to push Christ out of our lives, we still have to look for people to emulate. We have to look for people to be like. And many people look to others for real life, other people. Therefore, they make gods out of people like our athletes or movie stars or the rich and famous. And they try their very best to become just like them. These people go to great lengths to acquire that kind of lifestyle. They have to sacrifice so much for that. But of course, in this life, there is only so much someone can eat. You can only live in so big of a house. And you can only drive one car at a time. And these people try hard to imitate these false gods. They find that their lives, too, are still unsatisfactory. And what this does is it makes us give in to temptations. Right? We want more out of life. We want more, we want more, we want more. And this leads us to what? Cheat on our partners? which leads to just more anger and resentment in our life, more distrust in our life and people around us, and on occasion, it can go so far as murder and even suicide. All because we didn't look to the true north of Christ. People really have to put in effort and work hard for the life that you dream of. The problem with that dream is that you can end up bringing yourself into tough situations. You bring yourself under a cloud of debt, trying to have the newest and best, trying to keep up with the Joneses, which causes what? More anxiety, more worry, more problems. I grew up with a song called More Money, More Problems. I know many of you probably have never heard it, but it makes a lot of sense. Because now, guess what you have to do after you acquired all of this? Now you have to protect your stuff. And now you have to start to be fearful of keeping your power because there are more people behind you who want what you have. But it's also the same for people who try so hard to stay young and attractive looking. They spend great amounts of money and time and energy on the latest diets, fashion trends, plastic surgery, and on and on. Hey, but you know what? Eventually, no matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, 
Time is not on your side. Aurora and I have a good friend who is in her mid to late 40s, and she's doing all she can to stay young looking. And we recently spent some time up north with her and came to the realization that, wow, she must be so miserable, at least with herself. She recently had a surgery, and even though she thought she liked the results of that surgery, that didn't satisfy her. That wasn't enough. And that's the problem. Nothing but Jesus is enough. You know, we were sitting around a campfire, and I don't know where she kind of just says, you know, I wish I were younger. I would like to be 25 again, or maybe even 35. Those were my prime years. And my immediate response was, not me. Do you remember what you were like when you were 25, if you're being honest? <laughs> I'm 42, and I sure would never want to be 25 again. I've never been so happy in all my life than I am at this point with you all right now. My family and I do not have a lot of money. But we do have something that is much more valuable to us. And to me, it's one of the most valuable things in all of God's creation. We have life. Real life. Life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is who we seek to serve. This is who we try hard to be like. This is our one and only God. Now, honestly, this may cause us to look poor in the eyes of most people. But I have to tell you, since I became a pastor, I have never felt poor in a day in my life. And I take it about poverty. To be honest with you, I feel the reality that we are rich, rich beyond our wildest dreams. And people who don't have a personal relationship with Christ, they can't understand this concept at all. Some of my very best friends don't understand how I can turn down a good job to become a pastor. I hear it all the time from my friends. You know what I think? I think to myself, what reasonable beings can put in such hard work can bring themselves to miss out on so much love, so much happiness, so much joy for so little. But here's the thing. Everyone has a choice. Everyone is offered the bread of life. And some still prefer to starve to death. Why do you think that is? When our Creator, Christ, tells us, all that my Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Do you understand what he's saying here? You can gain the whole universe by pursuing God. And God, and God says and does these things because Jesus Christ regards us as a gift. A gift from him, or a gift to him from the Father. I want you to think about that for a second. Your creator thinks of you as his prized possession. What an awesome, awesome, awesome God we serve. You know, often, most times, us Christians, we think of Jesus Christ as the most unspeakable gift God could have ever given us. As something that breaks through language barriers and still cannot be described. We think of Jesus as the last crowning proof of God's divine grace and kindness towards us. But know that Jesus regards you and the saving of you from your fallen nature not as frustrating, not as aggravating, not as 
impossible task, but as a gift. You are a gift to be prized and treasured. And thank you, God, for that. But you see, still many people resist this incredible reality. We can all live in this place together. In verse 44, it says, No one can come to the Father. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I'm going to make a declarative statement right now. Just so you know, it is God's will that no person should expire, but that every person will accept the saving grace of Christ. You know, C.S. Lewis said it best when he said, you will never look into the eyes of another person who God does not love. The next time you look at someone close to you in their eyes, I want you to think of that. God loves you and them more than we will ever love anything in our lives. God draws each of us to himself, to Jesus. And this verb draws in verse 44, it implies some resistance to God's attraction. There is a resistance, a resistance to the draw. There is a great resistance to that draw. And as so many of us reject Christ's offer, or ignore it, or try to put it off until a better time in our life, as we continue to go through the motions, we try to find a meaning to our existence through our own pride. And know this, God gives us that choice. We all have free will, and I will speak about this almost every Sunday from the pulpit. It is a very big deal. It is why we are here. God did not create a bunch of computers to be programmed. This, at times, can be a double-edged sword. God is constantly calling for you. Right now, at this moment, he is calling you. It is our resistance to that call that can overcome God's draw. We can choose to reject God in our lives. We can choose hell over heaven, death over life. And to make this choice is like refusing bread when you're starving. And when we do that, we're refusing the very essence of the life we live. Jesus is the kingdom of God. And he wants you in heaven right now. You can live that way. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So we must feed on him. There's no other way to say it. There's no better way to express it. Not with such accuracy, anyway. Christians must absorb the teachings, his character, his virtue, all that is Christ, until his mind becomes our mind, and his ways become our ways, till we think as he would if he were in our place, until his power becomes our power. As Paul says it while sitting in a Roman prison, I have learned the secret to being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I have learned the secret to being content. Content in any and every situation. And if you have, then you have a steady diet of the bread of life. Have you removed your resistance to God's calling you to Christ? Now we must be sure to pass the bread basket. When I say this to you, please believe me. There's plenty enough of God to go around. You can't send out his love. You can't send out his wanting you. There's plenty. This bread is to be shared by all with everyone who will take it. And then when we share this bread with someone, that's 
when we learn the true value even more. This, my friends, is what it means to have real life. Amen. Now, would you please rise to your comfort level as we sing hymn number 349, or up on your streets. Please rise. Yesterday I spoke with Diane Colbeck on the phone, and um, her mother is in the hospital, and she is has a blood infection and pneumonia. And as Diane and I are talking on the phone, she's in her mom's room with her, and I heard her mom say, "No fun." <laughs> and I, I just I said I told Diane I said I'm going to include that in, in, in my in my prayer for for you and your mom, but just prayers for her mother Marie. And, and for Diane. And also I spoke with um, Pat Thumser, who was calling all my communion servers, is why I've got all these little prayers. Anyway, Pat just had um, eye cataract surgery. And it went well, and she's waiting now for the second eye, and she's just looking forward to better vision. And so just prayers for that. And then another one, um, Tish Anderson and Larry Anderson. Tish uh, was a teacher here in White Cloud. I worked with her. And her husband, Larry, is a state trooper, retired. And um, since April, Larry has had four strokes. They don't know, the doctors don't know what's causing them. Uh, they've changed his medicine several times. And just prayers for Tish and Larry, they're, they're just so frustrated. You know, you're in that realm of, you have a problem, but you don't have answers, and it's a very difficult place to be. Yes. And fourth, but not least, I have a joy. Amy, you're such a joy when you do children's <laughs> sermon, and your and, and your children. You really are. I hope you understand that you might not feel your message is getting across, but it is. And thank you for taking the time. To, to do that with our young people. I, I really appreciate you and, and um, your insight. I'll tell you what I appreciate about her is I see somebody else going through the same struggles that I have. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. I know what it's like. It's rough. They always say girls break your heart, but boys break your stuff. <laughs> so I love this. that's how it is. Uh, I had one sister. She was returned home from the hospital with hospice care. Only asked for peace and comfort Absolutely. for those involved. Absolutely. Thank you. Know your church is behind you and praying for it. Uh, 
four years ago. He had a surgery and ended up with an infection, and he was in the hospital for almost six months. Wow. Well, we have prayers for Ricky. Prayers for my granddaughter, Sky, who has to have a biopsy tomorrow. Sky? Sky. Okay. I have one. Um, our family dog is now 10 years old, and he is literally on one of his last legs. And we will be putting him down sometime this week, which is why the kids aren't here today. Uh, they're dealing with trying to figure out what our next step is with him. And so prayers for the family. Our oldest son, this has been his dog his entire life from the time he was born. Mm -hmm. We kind of paired the two up, and now... Life cycle happens, mm -hmm. and the kids have to learn a lesson this week. And so, prayers for the for the kids especially to um, for understanding. Really, are there any other joys or concerns this morning? If not, this is a new part of service where we're going to take a moment of quiet meditation. We're going to take a moment to bow our heads in silence and just be one on one with your God to raise whatever's on your heart up. So please take this moment now. Do we dare to believe in Jesus Christ? That is a question that often goes unspoken. But it does rest in our hearts. Lord, help us in our unbelief. Help us to be courageous enough to accept the love that you have for us and the power you must forgive and heal our souls. We live in a time of great hostility. There's fear and conflict. And it's easy for us to succumb to the terror and forget that you are always with us, seeking peace and hope. You have asked us to be instruments of your peace and justice in this world. But to do this, we need to change our attitudes and habits to reflect on your love and your compassion. Help us not to be vehicles of our greed and our need for approval. You gave us the bread of life, and he has taught us the importance of serving others. And in that service, we will do honor to you. Create in us hearts that are eager to serve, to witness, and to love. Open our lives this day and pour your healing mercies into them. You know what is on our hearts, Lord. Help us to be messengers of hope in this world who need the hope. And we do this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
as Christ loved us. Our ears hear these words in our worship. Our mind knows what they mean. Our hearts long to follow them. We know that tomorrow we will be tempted to slip into that familiar life when we are at the center of our world. As you give to God today, help us strengthen our resolve to love as Christ. Freely we have received, thus we freely give grace upon grace. Let us express our love and appreciation to God by extending the grace and mercy of God to a hungry world. Amen. Amen. Our closing song, one of my favorite. <coughs>
Go forth and live life as Christ in this world. Speak and live with integrity as you journey through this week, knowing that God will satisfy your every need and lead you to a victorious life. Go in peace with Christ. Amen. Amen.